Hi, everyone. Um, we're just going to give a couple of minutes for folks to filter in, but as we do so, we're just going to go through some of the different programming that is going to be coming up at the archive. And in the meantime, feel free to drop in the chat where you're signing in from. So I'm going to start by introducing Type West, which is a postgraduate certificate program in typeface design with public workshops and lectures. And you can learn more about our program on letarc.org slash education. We do have a few open houses coming up, so feel free to sign up for those if you're interested. And then we just have a series of workshops and lectures which will be coming up as well. The first one, which starts on October 12th and will end on November 12th is an online workshop titled Artistry in Motion, Learn Calligraphic Flourishing with Katie Levins. And during this workshop, you will learn to bring a splash of 17th century style flourishing to your letters in this dynamic four week workshop. The next one will be putting pencil to pixel where you will be unlocking the power of the iPad to create dynamic, polished and punchy lettering pieces. And you don't need to have any previous experience with Procreate or with lettering. Next up, we have a special event, which is called the Art of Storytelling, which will be a presentation and book signing. And during this unique evening, we will be joined by the designer, Kit Henricks, as he discusses his latest book and the value of storytelling in his career. Next up, we have Salon Series 44 coming up, which is in collaboration with our subscription to Mischief Exhibition, which is on view in our gallery right now. And during this salon, we will be joined with Chino BYI, also going by David Viorente and Kel Trofton. Um, Chino is the longtime editor of the Source Magazine's Graphflix column. To find out more about any of those events that I just talked about, um, please go on our website and go to the events page. And over there, you will have the opportunity to either sign up or to learn more about any of these events. Finally, welcome to Salon Series 43. Um, I will go ahead and introduce Sarah really quickly and then hand it over to them. Sarah Getz, the Collections Programming Manager at LFA, also my supervisor, <laughs> received their MFA from Ohio State University and the Didalis Foundation Award in 2017 and their BA in Visual and Media Studies, Arts of the Moving Image and Documentary Studies from Duke University in 2011. In their personal art practice, Sarah uses text, performance, video, sticky notes, and humor to develop queer speculative fictions. They eat lemons like apples and savor the fact that LMN is at the center of the Latin alphabet. Sarah manages the archive's online programming, including virtual tours and salons, as well as our docent program. And during this talk, Sarah will take us on an exploration of modular letter systems of the archive through the lens of transgender liberation. All you. <laughs> Right, everybody. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a struggle. Um, Thank you. Hi, again. Oh, I'm sorry, Pam. Um, There's so many it's not. Can you mute on yours? Okay. Um, they can't hear me. I think that might be old. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Getz. My pronouns are they, them. And my goal today is to build a neural pathway in each of your brains that forever claims modular typography as trans, as a trans non-binary ally. So um, some of you might be wondering, or maybe not, um, what is modular typography? 
And some of you might be wondering, why is this inherently trans? Um, interesting. I'm extremely close to my mic right now. Hold, please. I'll keep it in there. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ever. Um, okay, so the first question, what is modular typography? I will be um, answering uh, very shortly. The second question, uh, why is this trans? Uh, we'll take most of the talk to unpack, but before I get too far into my favorite subject, I wanna share a little bit about my approach to this whole question, um, philosophical approach. So you'll notice that this talk of this talk, the title of this talk is claiming transcestors in the archive, not finding transcestors in the archive. Finding trans people in archives or representing them in data in general faces a lot of barriers. Um, some trans people don't wanna be seen as such for reasons of safety. Um, some chafe at what labels are available. Some have no appropriate labels available in their time period or place. Um, and we have no record of their gender identities. So for all I know, and I dream about this, so I hope it's true, um, there may have been many trans people in the history of writing and typography, but uh, that part of their story has no vocabulary in that time and space, or maybe they knew um, of their gender expansiveness in themselves, but they hid it for their safety. Um, I imagine a lot of these things, um, or perhaps any trace of their transness was just bulldozed by the dominance of uh, cis gender binary in the years since they lived. So um, while this collection does in fact include uh, the work of some trans people and we've made a pile for the people who are here in person by pile, I mean, we set a table, a beautiful table, it's not a pile, um, uh, that, in that includes work of trans people that are in the archive, it's very pretty, um, uh, which me and some dear colleagues helped me collect over the course of this past week. Um, and I will release, release a, a list for those of you who are online. Most of what I'm actually showing um, today uh, is not that. I only know of one work um, in the archive created by a trans person who is more than a decade older than me. Um, and while anybody who is even a year older than me could definitely be a transcestor to me, um, I... Uh, where I can't find trans people, I uh, claim trans tactics. So um, one such tactic, obviously, is uh, modular type. So without further ado, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, um, what is modular type? You would be surprised at how many times I find myself answering this uh, question to uh, strangers. Um, and you'd think that I'd get a really succinct version of this. So. Um, the first book I'm gonna show you is actually The Anatomy of Type by our very own Stephen Coles, um, <laughs> who's blinking at me in surprise right now, <laughs> um, because there's this incredible diagram about the anatomy of type at the very uh, start of it. So um, this diagram shows the way that type designers think about the parts of the letter. So we've got this uh, horizontal stroke or crossbar. We have a bowl here. This is a diagonal stroke, an arm, a leg, an eye, an ear, a spine. It's all it's all very human, it seems. Um, a, a few that I will definitely be talking about is extenders, which are ascenders that are rising above the letter and descenders that are going down below it. Um, the reason I show this is because it gives you a sense of um, how you might break down the Latin alphabet into little bite-sized bits. So we have this um, anatomy vocabulary because they allow us to discuss shared features across um, letter forms, multiple letter forms within one alphabet. Um, so for example, uh, this is, so uh, for example, we have B, D, P, and Q, um, and they each have a bowl here and a um, ascender, or descender, um, so extender. So they both have extenders and bowls, or they all have extenders and bowls. Um, and this, this document 
is just a playful artist book that uh, toys with how these forms might uh, merge, uh, get confused for each other. Um, for anybody who's ever typeset, back. Thank you. Um, uh, how they might overlap to create geometric forms. Uh, it's all very exciting. Um, and when I was thinking through all this modular type business, one of the first things that I did was make an animation of this. So I'm going to share screen now. And I'm sorry, one moment. That's how it always goes, right? Here we go. Um, <laughs> Um, it is very cute. Cute is exactly one of the words I would use for it. So next time you hear somebody say minder P's and Q's, I really hope that this, this terminology comes back. Um, please think of this uh, animation. For me, it reminds me of this paper fortune teller that I and everybody else seems to have made in middle school. Um, and the color of this, um, well, okay, so the trans pride flag was invented in 1999 by a trans woman named Monica Helms. Um, pink for trans women, blue for trans men, and white for non-binary people. Dole's work is made in uh, 1967 in Germany. There was no trans flag, uh, but there is now. So uh, this work is trans now. I don't make the rules. <laughs> So we're going to go back to physical objects for a sec. So when a uh, type designer is thinking about uh, developing the look of a typeface, I'm going to see if I can maybe get a little bit closer. There we go. Um, when we're thinking about the look of a typeface, uh, they're thinking about how each of these pieces of anatomy function together within each letter and then across the whole alphabet or the whole typeface. So my favorite demonstration of this is uh, from Joshua Darden, who's a prominent uh, contemporary African-American designer. And this was a process piece from making what I think is Freight Big. Um, and it's from 2006, September 05. Love the, uh, love the date note here. It makes my job easy. Um, and the thing that really came out to me for this is actually, I'm sorry for the shadows here, but this moment, balance this policy. So he's got two different serifs happening here on the E and the F. And this idea, balance this policy, just this little note to self, really uh, struck me and made me uh, feel at home because the notion of a piece of type anatomy as a policy um, felt so much like what gender transition conversations have been for me over the years. Uh, the development, the amendment, the transformation, and the navigation of a personal anatomic policy. Um, and I similarly relate to this, this uh, note up here, which I'll just read for you because I, I don't know if it's legible. Um, a perfectionist working in an imperfect medium. The second note I, I also love, um, a Bodoni with warmth, um, acknowledging that this typeface is paying homage to the scholar printer Jim Battista Bodoni. So Bodoni is also the backbone of my next example of the ways that um, the anatomy of type gets broken down. So this is uh, Bill Bully's Basics of Lettering. Um, this is a manual for how to um, draw letters, um, paint them. And here we see our friend Bodoni. Um, so this breaks down how one might learn to do hand lettering of a particular alphabet. So, um, and I, I actually should say this, that I, I personally think that modular type could be entirely couched as a mix of lettering and typesetting, but we can get to that into the Q&A. It's the happy non-binary medium space. Um, and here you can see the whole alphabet. On the next page, you get to see a moment where um, you see all the pieces that construct that alphabet the basics with a K. 
of Potem. And I, I want you to, to take a good look at this because we'll be coming back to something later that uh, you'll be shocked at how similar it is um, in metal type. So finally, on, on these sets of pages, he shows exactly how to construct each letter from these pieces. So we've got um, this spine or stroke here, then we have the bowl, and then we have the terminal, and that's what makes J. Let me get this a little bit closer for the folks. So unless you've been trained in type design, you're not likely to see letters casually as um, something that is made of component parts, um, or you're not likely to think about it anyway. Um, nor, unless you're trans, are you super likely to glance at a person and consciously see them as a composition of many socially gendered factors. Our brains are trained to shorten this circuit uh, so that it doesn't take energy, so that we can understand um, what we're reading and what um, what social uh, cues we're maybe expected to take around the person we're talking to. Um, so another accidentally uh, gender expansive item in this collection is a type comparison manual uh, from Letraset. Uh, so this is, let me get further back out. Wider here. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, this company made rub down lettering, which I will get into later. And in 1967 in Germany, they created this wild catalog. Um, and it was designed to help you compare um, headings, uh, subheadings, and body type. So, we've got a nose with our subheading. I'm gonna be gentle here. We've got some eyes with some great eyeliner um, uh, with our heading here. So if I see eyeliner and I see nose, maybe I think to myself, okay, a femme person. Um, and then I see mustache and I think to myself, I'm so excited to hang out with this person. <laughs> So um, this is a location of type play, but also of body and gender play. Um, and modular type itself, uh, I think across all of the examples I have are extremely playful. Play is just a part of this concept. Um, this one is the only literal game, and this is the first example of an actual modular type set that I'm gonna be showing today. Um, so this is a game made for three to five-year-olds um, um, by uh, Bruno Minari in uh, Italy in 1960. And as you can see, it's it's made up of these uh, small pieces of plastic uh, that are they're slightly flexible and uh, they, in theory, are supposed to allow you to create the whole alphabet um, just from pieces. So the actual definition of modular type that I mentioned earlier. Well, it might not be like the most legible, mm -hmm. but it's pretty fun. Nice and cozy. And you see, just in case you lack imagination, it gives you instructions. <laughs> All right. So um, while there is that element of playfulness that I was mentioning across all of these items, um, the modular type systems uh, proper existed in serious commercial printing long before anything that I've just shown you. Um, 
In fact, most of what we have is uh, specimens from type foundries, we have in the archive is specimens from type foundries uh, designed to advertise modular type systems developed for metal type. Um, so we're going to start out with this one. We'll actually come back to this a few times. Um, um, this is a bound type specimen circa 1935 uh, from Bruder Butter, which is the Butter Brothers. Um, they are a uh, foundry in Dresden. Um, you can see on the cover, there's actually a silhouette of metal type here. So that's the, the layer where type is. This is how you know that it uh, where the bottom is so that you don't get your P's and Q's con confused. Um, and bound specimens like this one would usually contain multiple different typefaces. We're gonna, we're just going for Bodoni today. Um, so here's our friend Bodoni again. Um, they would always, well, usually contain these uh, waterfalls of different sizes um, and then a complete alphabet so that you could see all the different shapes that you would be getting. So these were essentially catalogs of metal type, and they would be sent to printers who would decide what they wanted to buy. So often these, uh, the back of the, in the back of these specimens, so in the front you'd see all these typefaces, and in the back of these specimens you would see, um, I'm going to get a thing. Um, you would see examples of ornaments, um, borders, vignettes, etc. that would um, help folks do whatever design task they needed to do. Oh, and also these like, more borders and bars here at the back. Um, sometimes you would get like fancy drop caps. Um, sometimes you would get these, these wild ornaments. Um, and when you ordered something from one of these places, um, you would get shipped to you a whole box full of these. Um, so I'm going to bite in. Here we go. Love it. Um, so these are sorts. Um, if you have never um, done any typesetting in your life, um, this is what you would actually uh, be uh, sticking together on a little tray and then putting in the print into the press. Um, anything that's at type height, which is uh, this area where this uh, uh, red L shape here is, um, would get inked and then uh, um, paper would be laid on top of it and uh, or put somewhere else in the machine and then um, put on the type so that you could get an impression, a very a light kiss. Um, and so in a print shop though, an innovative printer could actually print with anything. Um, we This right here is um, an example of a really exciting job, print job um, uh, from, this is the a print called for, it's a, Sorry, it's a book called For the Voice that is the print of a poem um, by Vladimir Mayakovsky um, from 1923 in Russia. And um, these were made up perhaps of just bars, spacer bars that were um, used to create space between other type. This is made from the scraps, I think, of, um, of a print shop. And it's exciting because you get these moments of, of illustration, but you also get some really wacky uh, type or letter forms that we have here, just from, like I said, print shop scraps. And again, this, this really wild illustration. So this is, if I didn't mention it yet, Ella Lizitsky for the voice. So around, we're going back to the Butter Brothers. Um, around a decade later, we have this evidence of um, print shops, who, or sorry, type foundries, uh, who are realizing 
going to everything but the right bookmark. Here we go. Um, print shops who are realizing that these printers are going wild in their own shops and making stuff out of, of, of anything they can lay their hands on. So uh, we get official modular type. So if you'll take a look at this. Um, so this is a negative positive, also known as NAPO. Um, we have this outline um, pieces here and then there's interiors here. And this is border material. It's almost identical, except that the shapes have been um, adjusted to uh, perhaps mimic some type anatomy. <clears throat> So on the previous page, you can see this introduced where we have our, um, our negative, our positive, and these together, which would be printed separately into two different runs. Um, and then on the following page, we see how these might be used in advertising. So it's fairly typical to have, have the, the set and then how it might be an example of in use. So then we also have in this same book a set of things that I would call semi-modular typefaces, uh, such as this one called um, Intermezzo. So Intermezzo um, it is the bottoms and tops of all of these letter forms. And I call it semi-modular because it's not actually based on uh, so much on the anatomy of the type as much as it's based on wanting to do a few uh, particular effects. So we've got this split effect here, or sorry, this separation effect here, bar effect, and we have a split top bottom effect here, and then we have a broken effect down here. And we'll see, we'll see all of these used in different places from that point on. And then we have the total other end of the bell curve, uh, which is another thing that I would call semi-modular, where the goal, the, where this typeface really shines, uh, it's decorishma, which I'm loosely translating as uh, decoration jewelry. Um, um, and you can see it's really good at doing things like modeling, um, modeling a form. It's doing illustration really well. We have this tie, which I would absolutely wear. Um, <laughs> But to create a letter form with it would be a pretty fiddly business. It's not, it's not gonna be fast, um, that's for sure. <laughs> All right. Um, so Intermezzo, Napo, and the Quarash Mark um, did a fair amount of traveling. So uh, we are lucky enough to be associated with um, a designer, docent, editorial correspondent, and dear friend of the archive, uh, Tanya George, who wrote a fa fascinating, fabulous article for our blog about the ways that um, type moved from country to country. In some cases, they were matrices that were licensed from one foundry to another. And in some cases, uh, we suspect they were just outright appropriated. Um, uh, copied maybe from print material that they saw, or one of these catalogs. Um, one particularly exciting of the former strategy of licensing um, is that of the Gujarati type foundry. So this type specimen was published circa 1940 um, in Mumbai. And let's see. here you can see Intermezzo. Um, which was renamed as the Narsim uh, series. And uh, they actually show you all of the pieces that you might uh, get in this kit um, and then show you how to construct them here. You have positive here and negative. Decora is also in here somewhere. Um, so there's a handful of things that are interesting about this layout, doing my due diligence to protect the spine of this book, because it's a little fragile. So get cozy while it gets cozy, please. 
I like the idea of being forced to take care of somebody else or uh, an object's body. Reminds me that I have one too. Um, so there's a few interesting things. Um, one is that this is the first time we are actually seeing um, for modular type uh, the pieces, um, at least the first time in the archive. Uh, that we're seeing all of the pieces that one would uh, receive, um, how many counts of each that we would get. Um, also, they are labeled in number. I'm going to make sure that I get a little closer. We're getting some labels in number. And then because they are then labeled, they can make this, this tutorial, essentially, of how to use it. Um, so uh, we know that this is two. Two rotated would be here, here, and there. And so you can actually learn how to use the modular type based on how it's being advertised here. Um, so the other thing that's really fascinating about this one is um, that we are seeing it in three different scripts here. So rather than try to stumble my way uh, through this uh, myself, I asked Tanya um, if she might share some of her um, knowledge and wisdom. So I'm going to share screen once more, and we will hear directly from Tanya. Mm, I'm not hearing anything, are you? To typeset three strips. Hold Latin. Go back. The excellent typesetters of the Gujarati Type Foundry specimen book use the Nepo series to typeset three strips. Latin, followed by Gujarati, and Devnagri at the bottom. While I don't read Gujarati, I can easily recognize its letters thanks to the bottom terminals turning right that have been retained by the designer. The Devnagri used to write Marathi here that I can read and write looks so futuristic and experimental even today that I imagine when it was typeset for this specimen almost a century back, it would have been unprecedented. The character curve stands out most with its hairpin bends. The positive design on the right shows this right canted uh, nib effect, which you see in more traditional designs, for which you just have to look at other curves in this book. The specimen is filled with many designs. Taking a closer look at uh, two of them, on the left, you have the modular blocks that have a forced perpendicular connection to that central vertical stroke. While on the right, uh, you see a more diagonal connection and the curves don't turn at breakneck speeds. These forms draw from Devnagri's calligraphic roots. The modules of the Nepo series kind of force the Gujarati type foundry typesetter to keep what was essential to legibility but use a creative license with the overall forms themselves. Almost like force-fitting Latin letter form features onto a different script, but in the hands of the gifted designers at work here, they shine. I haven't come across the use of Nepo for Indian scripts elsewhere, but apart from the ambitious design, it might also be because of the number of blocks in a font set that might not be enough to typeset a lot of text in Indian scripts. Thanks, Tanya. So I would not, um, I would have just asked her to come, um, uh, but it's uh, not a reasonable hour in, um, in Mumbai right now. Um, Okay, so if you're unfamiliar with Tanya George's work, um, please check her out. She does some pretty incredible stuff with multilingual and multi-script design, and she also does some really neat stuff with variable type. So if you're interested in the things you're seeing today, um, her work is going to be uh, very exciting and satisfying to you. So I mentioned earlier that she wrote this article um, about how sometimes type traveled without licensing. Um, so to my understanding, um, this is an example of that. So this is a, um, a type specimen from American Type Foundry, usually known as ATF, um, published in 1944. And in it, we have 
dun, dun, dun. Um, alpha blocks. Um, so it looks familiar, doesn't it? So it's essentially NAPO, um, except that they added a few forms. So they added the this character number eight here, which um, helps in the construction of lowercase letters. Um, you'll remember that most of what we saw from NAPO was uh, uppercases, um, capitals. And they also added a few things that would be, uh, you would be able to form them with NAPO, but you would have to double things up on top of each other. And then they asked, added a few um, mirrors. So essentially they added material to make it slightly more usable. Um, so there's a few reasons I'm showing this, um, partly because that travel across countries is interesting, but also because uh, this is the first time we're seeing it used for um, connected script here, this, this national radio. Um, it's also, I think, the first time we're seeing it for lowercase uh, at all through, through what I'm seeing. I'm not actually confident that I have examples of lowercase uh, modular type in any of the rest of my material. Um, the other thing, is um, it says Rooney here, and Rooney is the name of my 19 and a half year old dog. So uh, sh shout out, shout out to the old man. <laughs> the oldest person I know. Um, so our next example, I'm hoping that you can acknowledge by now that, that um, modular type is it's just cool <laughs> um, and it allows some freedom of expression. But I imagine some of you are wondering why do this? Like why bother? There's plenty of amazing typefaces in the world um, if you really wanna spice things up. So uh, here's one practical reason I'm actually not showing that yet. But um, So after the industrial revolution, there's an increase in book production, which means that there's an increase in literature or literacy, which means there's an increased demand uh, for a larger and more legible type for advertising and shop display. Metal type is costly. It's also very heavy. Um, and if you can imagine making something really huge uh, out of metal in this way, I think you can picture how obnoxious it would be to try to make something big um, to work with that. So some people turned to wood type. This is an example from the collection of wood type. It's about the, the length of my arm. Um, so you could get some really big stuff with that. And then some people turned to um, uh, constructed alphabets, such as this one. So you can see here that you can actually just insert more pieces to create um, taller forms. Oh, I should mention, um, this is a combi from uh, the German type boundary Ludwig and Meyer um, from 1932. So you could get this variety of um, heights and it's, its horizontal lines here are pretty reminiscent of those spacer bars that I was showing you earlier in um, For the Voice. Um, and I've often actually wondered myself if this was just somebody's um, type, sh like type shop experiment um, gone really uh, series. So this is another one um, that I've recreated in digital space and made made an animation of. So old goose. <clears throat> so this is the the first in an ongoing series of digital animations in which I'm articulating modular type as sort of a, a little manifesto space uh, for ways that it could be a useful ally um, in my gender journey. Um, I found Combi useful in thinking about the ways that my experience and expression of my, my own gender is rather constrained by the environments um, I'm in rather than my own perception of it as sort of the, the goldfish effect. Is it goldfish? that do that? Um, yeah, okay, yeah. So the goldfish effect. So in other words, uh, I guess I think of my my gender experience as modular enough to that it could grow to any size um, given, given the right space. 
<laughs> Thanks for those snaps. <laughs> So an, another typeface that I found uh, useful to think through in my gender journey um, is uh, Nebbiolo's um, Meccano. So it's Fregio Meccano, uh, Meccano maybe. I, I ask a, an Italian speaker directly in front of me. <laughs> um, um, and it means, so Fregio means ornament and Meccano means mechanism. Like Comey, it can expand um, vertically. The, the thing that's exciting about um, Meccano is that it can also expand horizontally. So here's the original specimen here. Um, like before, we see that it's got these, well, maybe you can't see here, but uh, it has numbers, um, but the it is not labeled. We're not actually getting a tutorial here. It's a little delicate. Um, so I also animated this one. Oh, um, you might be stuck in the other view. Hold, please. So, I, <laughs> um, so I was animating this one over the summer, um, June and July, uh, and I found myself really uh, overswept by pride season, um, and that season always brings a lot of joy and a lot of anger, um, and gratitude and grief um, all together. I, I explode with joy at things like finding the Boston area queer scene really warm. Um, I explode with anger at um, some of the battles that I know we're all really tired of fighting. Um, and grief at the backdrop at climate change, especially this summer, um, uh, and the chronic migraines that that smoke induces, um, and gratitude at every single ray of sunshine that I get to touch my face. So I based this animation on the pace of fireworks, which also explode. So for my next example, we'll go back to the dot cam. I have this big heavy book. <laughs> um, and I can, so big I can't even see my tabs right here. Yeah, that's a good idea. Actually, I think that might, that might be the right size. Um, so it's a book within a book. Uh, so this is a reference book that we have in the archive. Um, uh, it is a collection edited by Paul McNeil, and what we're seeing now is a Czech example uh, designed by V. Kansky. Uh, it's called Patrona, grotesque. Uh, Patrona translates to cartridge, as in something that you can plug and play, and is made um, with 38 modules, uh, which are referred to as uh, polytypey or halotypen half types. Um, it's remarkable because it's actually designed to work with both Cyrillic and Latin form, letter forms. Unfortunately, we don't have any examples of it, of it in use in Cyrillic, although I would really love to see that happen. Um, so unlike other modular typefaces that we've seen so far, uh, Patrona doesn't actually disguise its nature as a modular typeface. It actually wants to be seen all these spaces in between it. Um, I think it wants to be clocked as module modular. Um, it wants to be seen as constructed typography, and I can identify with this desire to be seen as both individual pieces and a whole at the same time. So our, our other example here was never made into a metal typeface. Um, this is from Joseph Albert's it's a combination shrift. Um, Joseph Albert's known in um, 
the art world largely for uh, his color theory work. Um, also designed in proper um, simplicity and elegance, for simplicity and elegance sake, modernist utopian style, um, designed this modular type system that's the smallest um, of, of them. Uh, it's only three forms are necessary, a circle, a square, and a quarter circle. Um, uh, yeah, so a lot of the um, demonstrations of this that he created, these sort of sketches, uh, show it also existing with these 10 forms that would make it more practical if you were um, using it for um, on, on letterpress. But like I said, it's never made into such one. So the entire alphabet in three shapes is pretty not um, pretty exciting. And uh, that reduction tendency is something that shows up across many of these um, things. You'll saw you all saw in um, Gujarati type foundry, it, it bragged that NAPO was only 15 elements. Um, and uh, some of that is because it's just a bargain. Uh, it's a smaller amount of uh, material to to buy. You could just recombine shapes. I, it, if anybody's ever run out of a, like a letter while they're uh, typesetting before, uh, you know the pain of trying to invent an L from nothingness. Um, uh, so, well, where are you here? So, um, can I get a drum roll? Can anybody do that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <Amazing>. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so now for the moment you did not know you were waiting for, for your whole life, <laughs> hailing from Barcelona, Spain, with, from one wild individual named Juan Tr Trochu Blanchard. Here is the largest modular typeset, weighing in at an astounding 555 modules. So this is Super Tipo Velos. And it's the reason I'm here <laughs> today. You had more wisdom. <laughs> um, so with 55 basic forms and three to five forms roughly used per letter, um, you could make up to four trillion different letter forms with this typeset. And to me, that sounds about just the right number of genders to experience in a lifetime. <laughs> um, so, welcome to the house of abundance. So, I could also imagine this getting really overwhelming. And it seems that so did they. Um, seeing all of these different character sets. So here, here you've got these character sets. And hey, doesn't this look a lot like that uh, lettering manual that we saw earlier from Bodoni of, of how to create Bodoni? The, the forms are really similar, um, which I never would have thought to myself just sitting in my studio working with them. But the archive provides a lot of connections. Um, so yeah. So in order to advertise this typeface, um, they simply made many examples of uh, different alphabets that one could create. It keeps going. We hate spiral down things <laughs> at the archive, at least I do. We also had these minis, like teeny tiny friends that have slightly different patterns inside of them. There's alternates for the biggest forms. Oh my gosh. So we could we could do this for the next uh, three hours of our lives. Um, and trust me, I would be happy to. Um, but I'm gonna give you a little walkthrough of, of um, what these, look like. So th this is a publication called Novatum. Um, it was 
started out, so this is the first one. We have several, we have four volumes of them. This is the first volume of this publication and it was created by um, uh, Esteban uh, Tro Blockman Trochu, same, same name. Do not know what relation, if any. Um, and so this, this piece, or this item really, it feels a little bit like uh, just a design magazine, uh, something that might be for advertising, but just might be for thinking through things. I'm not totally sure. Um, there are a few essays in it and a lot of samples of type. And um, and it's clear that uh, one Trochu Blanchard was, was thinking hard while working on this. So we actually have some examples of some illustration made from ornament that um, look remarkably like what, what turned into the forms um, that would later become super velos. We have this example of um, just forms made from, from literally border elements and uh, geometric forms that were around. This is the one that, to me, just screams, <laughs> just screams. Um, this is a prototype for um, Super Tipo Velos. These U shapes are everywhere. Um, uh, the idea is that actually some of these forms are in Super Velos. Uh, this one right here, not that one, um, that one. And this, you know, they look a lot like some of the other um, modernist typefaces that we have seen so far. So um, one could continue to explore these and find beautiful connections, but um, rather than dwell on this sort of prototype phase, I'm going to show you all some, some other things. Um, so by, by Novatum 2, uh, Super Tipo Velos was fully realized completely. It's here, it's ready. It's ready for you to use it. And um, they clearly understood that this was complicated. Here are images of um, lockups. These are the what what a type um, tray or like what your print bed looks like before you um, ink it and then send your paper across it. Um, so these are the six different lockups that you would need to make this image. And it's worth it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so every single page of every single Novatum is incredible. And if you want to see them yourself, uh, schedule a research, a research visit here at the archive at least two weeks in advance, please. Um, and uh, one thing that I think is interesting here is that we are seeing examples of it um, in use with uh, just, I think, things that you would just ordinarily find in the type shop. Um, and then we have another form we're not seeing uh, uh, type only uh, illustrations here. These are uh, another form of illustration next to the core um, Super Velos. So here, Super Velos is acting as type. It's not really acting as illustration yet. Uh, so that was volume two. Uh, we're skipping volume three, we just are. Um, to come to the glory of volume four. This is such an item. <laughs> um, um, so there's a few things actually that I wanna say before I, I get into this. Well, maybe not, maybe not. Um, I totally stopped looking at my notes. This is why, why we're having a moment. Hold the please. All right. So. This is the final and truly after you make this, what what else do you need to do? You're done, <laughs> go, go rest. <laughs> um, it's a walkthrough of all of, a bunch of different forms of printed matter that one might execute with this system. 
And like I said, this might feel overwhelming to someone. So through these examples, we're also getting a, a thorough tutorial on how to create these. So we've, we've got everything from uh, uh, business cards. This is a very cute owl. Check out this owl. Um, you could make a whole menagerie, and believe me, I will, um, um, animating these. I'm excited. Um, there's a baby announcement for Juan Esteban. Fictional, I'm not sure, but maybe not. Um, book covers. Maria again. And then these gorgeous full page spreads. Um, so I'm just gonna hang out on this one for a while because he's sweet. Um, look at this brush. <laughs> um, and oh, oh my gosh, there's so many great mustaches in this book. You have no idea. <laughs> um, if, you're, if somebody with good facial hair uh, potential out there is shopping for a new book, this is where you should go. Um, so uh, this, the thing about this book is that we've got all these examples on the right page, on the right hand side, you've seen this. On the left hand side of the page, on the, actually it's on the reverse here. Um, is all an imprint of every Super Velos and other systems. This is just um, some geometric forms that were probably just ornaments. Um, uh, so you get every item of Super Velos uh, or every module of Super Velos that is needed to create um, the work on the reverse side. You also get um, a list of what typefaces were used. Um, you get in French, Catalan, and English, something that operates somewhere in between advertising and manifesto. Um, these, it, like reading through these is, is a, a trip um, because it, it really does go back and forth between this, like use my type system to, this is world changing. Listen to me, it's incredible. Um, the thing that's so exciting about this is that, well, there's a few things here. So the, you'll see examples of this, which they called pure typography or la typographia pura. And on the and on these backs, you see these imprints. And it's unclear to me if these texts, so small caveat, it's unclear to me if these texts came from um, Esteban Trochu Blockman or um, who's credited with various other writings um, and definitely I think published all of these. Um, or one true show Blanchard who created the system. Um, so about five years ago, we had a visitor, um, Alexander A.K. Sasha from uh, the Lubalin Center in New York, or Lubalin, I'm not sure, um, came to do a lecture on the history, the origin story of this typeface. And that talk is excellent, uh, but it's also available online. So I'm not gonna re repeat all of it, but I need to give you a short summary for some things to make sense. Um, so y'all have seen that this is Nebbiolo, the person that they made in the Kenno, which you see here. Um, where this sits physically in this book is really remarkable. So we have um, lots of type and use examples, type faces, those uh, waterfalls that I was showing earlier, and um, directly between all of that and all of the modular, uh, or sorry, all of the ornaments is the one modular typeface. It literally sits in the dividing space between ornament and type. And at this particular time, if you wanted to make an illustration in, in any of your work, you had to find a way to do that that meant some other print shop's material. So you could do etchings. Um, so this is very much not meant for a digital space. Um, so this is an etching. Um, so you could custom order an etching of some print. You could do photolithography. You could do uh, woodcuts. You could do all forms of uh, different ways to create images um, on a print bed. But um, that uses materials that are outside your shop. And either 
Juan Trouchot Blanchard found this very, very frustrating, or, or both. Um, he was just really excited about typesetting, like really excited. Um, and, but what pure, pure typography, this system uh, that he developed, what that actually means in practice is that you wouldn't have to leave the type shop to do anything. You could just make anything you wanted from the material in front of you. Um, you could just let your imagination go wild. Um, and this is, at least to, to my understanding at this particular moment in time, there's no other single modality way to create both type, um, I mean, other than illustrating, but so no um, single modality way to create both type and image and then have the scale of output that you would have uh, for uh, printmaking. Um, so the single medium process is more like uh, the use of a computer that we have now, that flexibility. Um, and he thought it would change the world, really, truly. Um, and it changed my world, so I guess it's chill. Um, so, oh, I forgot to mention this. Um, the other big question always with something like this is, what, what typeface do I use next to this? And um, this typeface, it uses the same forms as the rest of Super Velos. Uh, he called it Byzante. Um, but luckily for all of us, it was revived by Type Republic, who made these um, as well. <clears throat> in so the the revived version of of Byzante, meaning the usable, uh, the very very usable version of Super Velos, is available online for free downloads um, on Google Fonts. It's called Troshu. Um, so in 2004, Type Republic also released a revival of most of the character set of um, Super Velos. And this is a really beautiful example of a bunch of different artists using it. It's gorgeous. Um, this is their another piece that came with it where they showed the character set. They showed some of his early sketches. Um, I'm going to show just one for each one so I can not about that one. This one, I like this one a lot. Mm -hmm. You can just get the vibe. Um, <clears throat> so for the sake of time, I'm just gonna really breeze through a couple of other examples of contemporary uh, modular type. So so this, uh, well, let's see that one, let's see that one. So Super Velos, the digital version, um, is not easy to use on a digital in a digital space. Um, the manipulation of something something that is as simple as turning an object from here to here is just it puts the the mommy in manipulate like your your hand really is um, the best thing for it. Um, it's not that easy in digital space. And the folks at uh, Type Republic who made the digital Super Velos also made um, a handful of versions of those uh, alphabets that I showed you earlier from the Abundance catalog. Um, so I wanted to show another example fully. Uh, this is um, Mano. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's a Hangul modular type. It's actually using only five forms. We've got a stroke bar, side stroke, an apex, curve, and a bend. Um, this is from the designer on on Sang Su of um, AG Typography. Um, he apparently revolutionized uh, Hangul in in uh, contemporary use, and um, he's really known for taking uh, Hangul outside of its, its square format. Um, interestingly, this, this typeface was made to uh, be two scripts, so we get it also in Latin forms. Um, and I would be very sad not to show you just a couple of uh, examples of the use of this. So here's this gorgeous gate. Just some beautiful something. I can't read this, but it, it just makes me, I don't know, it's emotive for me somehow. Um, 
So the other contemporary thing that we have here is um, digital digital modular type is P22's blocks. Um, these are not, I, this is not exhaustive by any means, um, but this, this is what we've got in the shop. So you could uh, get this as plastic blocks, which you could use. Um, obviously this is NAPO um, alpha blocks recreated to contemporary times. You could get it as plastic blocks. Uh, you could also get it as a as digital blocks. They did something incredibly smart here, um, which is that that thing that I was complaining about about how it's it's hard to turn things um, digitally. It's not hard, but it's it's uh, harder than you would want when using modular type. They actually mapped each key, each letter, um, capitals, lower cases, and punctuation. Um, to different, not just different modules, but different uh, rotations of that module. So in theory, you could sit and type this out. And for anybody who's ever coded or used used uh, uh, Adobe extensively, you know how beautiful it is to not use your mouse if you can. Um, and um, yeah, so that's a very exciting um, digital specimen. So. I actually think that the most exciting result of a digital modular type is the flexibility that it gives us in working with other materials. So this is where, where the action is um, in modular type today is stencils. Um, this is also common in lettering for the last hundred years at least, um, if not more. So these should look a little bit familiar. We've got these are from my personal collection. Um, we've got Combination Trift, our uh, Joseph Belbear's thing. We have Super Velos, a very limited set, but it's really useful. Um, we have Meccano. I miss the lines in this, I will say. Um, but the thing that's great about stencils is that you get reversals. It's something that is annoying in type um, to not have. I was going to demo these, but I think for time, it will not. Um, I need this guy. So I actually think that the best, easiest way um, that I to use modular type, because uh, before I stumbled across this, I was largely typesetting. That's what, what I was excited about. I wanted to typeset so badly with, um, with Super Velos, but it's just, <laughs> I think you have to go to Barcelona um, <laughs> to find it. I'm not even sure that it's there. Um, if somebody can confirm or deny this on the internet, please, um, I'll be grateful. Um, so what I decided to do with some grant money uh, from the Daedalus Foundation was to make rub downs. Uh, so these were popular in, the 70s, I mean, these didn't exist. These are custom ordered, but um, this technique was popular in the 70s. Um, 60s and 70s changed uh, um, independent printing as we know it. And I love it um, because you can do some pretty cool stuff. Um, it's really easy to manipulate them in space. Um, here, let me backlight this a bit. Let's see competing lights versus we'll see how we do on the internet. Is that working? Um, so what's really great about working with rub downs is that not only are they just really easy to manipulate, they're, they're actually super fast. Um, so I didn't mention yet that Super Tipo Velos was um, named, that Super Tipo Velos translated means super fast type. Um, and this version of Super Velos really is fast. Um, this is my own little manipulative uh, or manipulating space here. But anyhow, so you can see how a design, a simple design could, could come through in minutes using this material as opposed to, you know, hours using typesetting. Um, 
And I have found that it's really useful in combination with digital space though. So um, rub downs are really great uh, because they are extremely precise um, and they make, they scan well is the short version of that. They make great vectors. Um, and then I tend to put them into digital space to manipulate them further. So I'm gonna share a couple of things. So using rub downs, I can make stuff like this. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just exciting. It's exciting to, to work with something that feels so flexible and so com complicated at the same time. Um, So if there's any of you out here uh, still wondering, uh, why is this trans? Um, uh, the short answer is that for me, uh, modular type is my wingman. Um, typography is a perfectly safe subject to broach in mixed company. <laughs> um, generally speaking, um, or maybe just kind of outside this building, um, a debate about typography is unlikely to result in violence. Um, and modular typography has been a really great ally to me. It's a litmus test for a stranger's tendency to reject, tolerate, um, or celebrate complexity in something that they once saw as simple. Um, if a stranger can stretch their imagination enough to embrace the breakdown and recombination of shapes that humans use to make letters, then there's a real possibility that they might be able to embrace the breakdown and recombination of the qualities that um, humans use to perceive gender. Um, so if someone can acknowledge that expansiveness and combinatorial potential of supervalos, perhaps they can acknowledge the expansiveness and combinatorial potential of me, us, <laughs> Um, and through my work with Supervalos in particular, AKA super fast type, I feel like I've found a form of solidarity. Um, it's a, a support, a feeling of being seen that has kept me afloat in my darkest, loneliest moments. And it's really allowed me to transform this feeling You can read. <laughs> um, and so now when I ask myself this question of like, what, what gender do I feel like today? Um, I can answer myself this. Just a super vast type. Thanks y'all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is my favorite part, taking questions, um, and I definitely went over, so unfortunately we won't have that much time. Um, but before we take questions, I want to thank folks who have encouraged me um, in this line of research, um, some who will see this in recording, and some who are here. Um, Alex Ofre, um, my ride or die forever. <laughs> um, uh, Lucesa Brempman Verissimo for just like being really jazzed about all of this all the time. Um, Lou and Joy for some of that formation. Jay Pants, uh, Ellie Kwa from Baum. Um, Sally Beal, Johnny Avot Smith for just telling me this is cool. <laughs> and everybody saying this is cool and this is hella trans. Um, Tanya George, Michael Carabetta, Guy Menga, Mangan D, and Fran Roca for always pointing me to new and exciting things. Oh my gosh, Eric Monson is here. This is my first supervisor of all time. I'm so excited. The first person who got me into typography. <laughs> Big claps for Eric. Um, uh, extra special thanks for everyone in the archive for holding this material <laughs> and being a weird, wacky family who could celebrate this obsession. 
especially those who helped me pull. Um, Manisha Ganesh, I don't know what I would do here without you. Stephen Cole, Paula um Jada Haynes, Elise Carlton, who's on here somewhere. Nikki for handling the doors tonight. <laughs> um, Manisha again <laughs> for all that they do. Um, and of course, um, my partner Nick Blitzi, our dog Rooney, and most especially my cat Combsy, um, uh, for listening to me geek out at all the hours of day and night. Um, so I actually have twice as many objects as I showed and possibly twice as many as stuff to talk about. And I'd love to take questions and maybe if something's relevant, I'll pull it out. So thanks. Oh, Brandon Dan says, what, will there be a part two? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, maybe. Um, we could figure that out. I think I think it might be like a small class if I do it that way. But this is uh, I actually could have talked about any single one of these objects for probably half an hour. Um, so maybe if somebody works at a university, hire me to do a course. <laughs> um, yeah. Questions about type? Any extra knowledge in the room? I'm you know I love this but uh, all geeks alike, <laughs> masterclass. Love it, thank you, Brandon Gam. <laughs> you can also push on me on some of these claims because I made some bold ones, I think. <laughs> if everybody's silent, I'm gonna talk about lettering again. Okay. Yes. What? The name of the chamber color that people on that's like the computer or anything. I just feel like you need to do a Okay, perfect. Love it. Um, let me see if I can find the name written out. Otherwise, we'll just draw. Um, oh, you did. Oh, um, you can't have tons of the art, so I don't actually know if I can uh, do it large enough. Um, so it's T R O. Uh, C H U T. Thank you. That's um, one of the names of the designer of this typeface, of uh, Super Velos, particularly. Uh oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen, <laughs> for all of the dropped links. That's so helpful. Question. From GPS, I know if you were to design a brand identity for a font organization, what modular type would you use for the building? Oh, there's no question about this for me. <laughs> it's not even hard. Um, I would use um, I would use Super Velos for sure. Um, it's just uh, so one of the things that I didn't talk about is that um, we're frozen on the dock cam. I can see it. Oh, okay. Okay. Technical problems. Um, so folks online can see this. Um, there are so many options inside of this, and truly, in terms of use, every time I use a different modular typeface, I get a little sad. It's kind of like, I don't know, like if you're poly and you're allowed to kiss somebody else, but you don't really want to. Um, and, um, so for modular type, this is my, this is my favorite place. Don't worry about it. We're all good. Um, this is my favorite place to play. Um, it's my favorite place to think. And, um, it's actually not as, so it's, it, there's a lot of pieces, but it's not impossible to get your brain around after two years, roughly of working with this in this me method, um, maybe a year and a half, um, I got to know that there's really, there's four basic uh, pieces to Super Velos. Um, there's these core, core bits. So for folks online, these, um, for folks here, I don't know if you can see that, but. Um, oh, Tanya's here. <laughs> Hi, love it. Um, uh, so, 
for so these core pieces um, that there's these variants, these alternatives um, of like we've got those as one set, and then we have these what I would call connectors, um, which have so there's a regular end on all of them that um, connect to each other, and there's one size for that. And so connectors to me are the ones that have um, two business ends, basically two or more um, that you can connect to things. And then we have things that are more like, I don't know, I kind of think of them as the terminals, meaning like they're ones that that start larger and get much smaller. Um, uh, they look like they could have one complete end. Um, you could always end stuff blunt. And then there's um, this other set, which are like the, the swashes. Um, and those are ones that feel like they could live on their own. Um, they look like they were created as a stroke and can live on their own. Um, so I would definitely use Super Valos, no question. Um, what that logo would look like, I have no idea. How do we put trans people into logos? I'm, um, I'm more of an artist than a designer, um, I think. Although that's getting more blurry the longer I spend at Letterform. Um, um, no, not what, what I am, but what that distinction is. I, it's confusing. Um, uh, where can we see more of my animations with modular type apart from this recording? Um, right now, Instagram. Um, that's probably the best spot. That's where they'll end up first. Um, as soon as I make something that's longer than two minutes, um, uh, they will go to film festivals um, first, probably. And um, it might turn into this talk, but animated. Um, uh, oh, modular, ever-evolving lockup. That would be the only way to have a trans um, logo. You are right. Um, Brandon Gam is correct about that. Um, this is my answer. Um, ah, yeah. Yes, Sue, what's up? Um, so you're, well, you're, you're using this in a way like a, like a paintbrush, the way that we saw it illustrated in the November work. And I wonder how does it feel, how is it better for you to use this instead of having the limitless ability to paint with the brush or to draw why is it better for you to have these elements? This is a great question. I'm going to repeat it for these folks because I don't think it was audible. Um, uh, Stephen Coles just asked me, why is it better for me to, uh, well, he said, I'm using these like a paintbrush. Why is that better than um, uh, using an actual paintbrush, I think? Um, that was the question, right? Yeah, so... I feel when I'm using these, I actually just feel like I'm dancing with one true show, one shard. <laughs> I'm like, you magical being, let's make something cool together. Um, and that feeling of collaboration um, across time and space, just through our brains, like is the output of his brain and the output of my brain getting to do something cool together. Um, is less lonely. I mean, I put up this slide about big trans lonely, but it's truly that like when I do this, I feel connected to every trans person that's ever lived and I don't know why. It's semi-religious at this point. Um, and by semi, I mean it is. Um, and, uh, but but in a very practical sense, so there's that, there's that, the sort of spiritual side of it. Um, which it cannot be downplayed truly. But um, the other part of it is that um, constraint breeds creativity. Um, being stuck with these forms. And I have I have drawn out actually a few forms that I would like to add to it. Um, I kind of, you know, I don't know about ATF with, with alpha blocks. I'm really not sure about that, the, the history of that or the ethics of them taking it, but they added stuff to NAPO and what they added enabled something else. And I care about that. Um, and I have a short list um, and a drawing. So one of the things that I love about uh, these is that I usually come with two tools. Um, one is my thing that helps me rub them down and the other is my X-Acto knife um, because I find myself cutting up Super Velos all the time. Um, I use pieces of it all the time. I've got a, 
a little list. Next time I get um, rub downs made, I have some forms to add, which are just mod they're just uh, further broken down pieces of the the typeset. But there's some stuff missing. I don't even know if I have all uh, 555, but maybe. <laughs> Thanks. It's been so fun to talk about literally my favorite things. <laughs> Ellie. What's the most complex object or form you decide to construct using string images? Huh, that's really interesting. Probably that swimmer. And I tried to do it at a smaller scale than I should have. Um, I didn't quite know when I was getting started. That's why I've got these, uh, this set here. Um, that you saw me do this little demo on, that'll actually turn into something at some point. Um, but um, it's it's interesting. I, I actually was serious when I was talking about his menagerie. He's got all of these examples of like beautiful roosters, uh, fish, all these all these different creatures in there um, that I think are really exciting. But one of the things that that he does well that I sometimes feel like I'm not totally getting from his typefaces, there is a very fine line between just enough and overcomplicated with Super Velos. It can get messy really easily. So um, most complicated, I don't know the answer other than that, that swimmer maybe, um, but hardest was actually a tiny lemon. I, I was trying to um, create an animation of a lemon growing and it, Every time I did it, it just got too messy <laughs> and it needed to be really, really simple and I couldn't quite find the right lines for it. And uh, one thing I have noticed with this is that when I'm, when it, when something's getting messy, scaling the object up in physical space um, gives me more room to be uh, more precise. That's not the answer you, <laughs> but, but I got somewhere. <laughs> Thanks, Ellie. Um, there's something in the Q&A. It's insane, this talk. Thank you. Thank you, R. Appreciate you. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you asked this. So I've actually done a variety of animations uh, with Super Velos. When I first started doing them, I was animating that type that you saw at the end, the super vast type that's moving around. Um, and I wrote my own software to do that because I wanted to have a backbone that stayed the same and then a, a like essentially like limbs, like the arms and the legs, the terminals, et cetera, of the, the ears of the type to have uh, movement in them. And, uh, but for it to really be clear that it's the same thing. And that actually came from, I'm also a hula hooper and uh, having a core that a, an object is going around is really nice. Um, uh, and it, I don't know, makes me think more fluidly. But so for, for that, I could not find software that I thought was useful to me. Um, uh, so I just wrote my own in Python and which was useful for me, although it feels a little silly now. Um, uh, but then the swimmer, who I did a combination of stop animation and um, digital, what you find, what, what the end product was is something I exported from After Effects. Um, turns out coding helps a lot when you're using After Effects. So I actually like that software now after 10 years of railing against it. Um, uh, and, but in order to create that, I needed to know what the basic forms were. And so for that, I needed to do something that is like flip animation, essentially. I created six different more than six slightly, but six different form, six different states of the swimmer and um, made a design for each of those. And then uh, digitized all those, ended up having to cut all that apart so that the limbs would move more fluidly in digital space. 
Um, but yeah, the workflow was um, make an outline of what I think the thing is, uh, print that on a, just an inkjet printer, uh, use rub downs to make an out uh, to make it in Super Velos, scan those, turn them into a character animation in um, After Effects using like pinning and pinning technology, the same way you see in most character animation that's, you know, cartoons and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, work from there to, to make it, <laughs> think of it as frame by frame so that everything looks fluid. But I also, yeah, I used to, I studied film first before I got into any of this stuff. So you designing the fact what artists have been the inspiration for you and the fact that <laughs> Chase laughing at me <laughs> because, oh man, that question. I, I I could list you a thousand names right now. Um, ooh, so uh, playing tonight, actually, all of y'all missed this. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so that you could come see me. Um, uh, playing tonight at the Roxy um, is uh, Soda Jerk. They're a sibling pair that does really wild appropriation videos. So their their stuff is like cop, like they take characters cobbled together from uh, all kinds of different sources and create narratives with them. Um, the if you here I'm gonna type this in the was soda jerk. Um, the avalanches that's their that's the movie i first saw of theirs and um uh it's like a, oh i don't know six minutes long it's a essentially an animated music video and it's it's wild but their their method of i don't know taking a lot of disparate elements and somehow making them work together is really exciting obviously uh Juan Trucheau, Lynn show artist is pretty pro shoe i keep doing that i switch the syllables um is a big inspiration. I find myself looking at his stuff in detail a lot. Um, but um, other major influences are my friends, <laughs> sweet babies. Because <laughs> um, um, it's it's yeah, it's lonely out here, you know. <laughs> like, but it's it's really nice to see people do some really cool things. So uh, Jay Panza's work is right here is really amazing um uh, yeah i could go on on this forever so i'm gonna stop myself yeah jay um, you kind of touched base on it but what are some of the for your work about the technologies it's kind of refer to that a lot um but it's just interesting to see this one that has more of a sense Yeah. Can I can I try to repeat it back? Um, maybe. Uh, so, question being, so giveaway. Jay's work deals with grids, and they're the person I think of when I think of grids. And um, uh, the question being, like, can can one get outside of the grid when thinking about a lockup? Um, so the lockups, oh, I keep thinking to myself that I can show this, but, um, so for folks online, anyway, you can see the lockup that's in the front of this. Oh, it's 
small, slow gestures um, to respect the material. Here we are. Um, so there's this lockup, folks in person, in case you forgot. Um, folks online, here you go. So the lockup is a grid. Um, it's not always a grid, is the short answer. There are mechanisms that exist that allow you to do things on angles, sometimes very complex angles, but they require you to be able to make wedges that sit in between um, those things. And like, so there, there's complex mechanisms. And I think everybody has been trying to get out of the grittiness of, uh, grittiness mm -hmm. of, um, of lockups really since they were made. There's always somebody who's just like, we must break down the constraints of this. And I think Super Velos is an interesting thing because it is really grid bound, um, even though it's so comparatively organic. Um, there's an actually a really good that you will love. And you should come see this in in detail after. Um, that like almost leans into the grid in order to break it. Um, and I'll I'll show you this uh, up close in a bit. But for folks online, this is what I'm talking about. Um, the J is in your color. It's actually in my color and your color. <laughs> wow. Um, so there are ways to get out of it. Um, I think typesetting is always, typesetting uh, with metal type will always have a relationship to it no matter what it wants. Um, using rub downs, actually this is a thing I meant to mention, is that one of the things that I love about them is that uh, you can overlap them. Um, and so you really actually can completely escape the grid. Um, using these forms. And I don't know, it's it's hilarious. The whole swash thing is, is funny because I'm getting back to that whole lettering and modular or modular type being the space between lettering and, and uh, metal type um, because it it's like craving the grid escape that that um, that I think you're talking about that that lettering is doing so well. Um, you know, you can do any swashes you want. <laughs> you don't need a grid. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but yeah, okay, we'll go with it. Well, I just in response to that, one thing that can help us think, at least in terms of typography outside of the grid, is to think about writing systems that aren't so based on grid systems like Latin. So Arabic has been trapped in this kind of metal grid since the beginning of type and now with digital type they're finding all sorts of ways of getting outside of that and arabic digital type is now informing what we can do to expand without we think of latin type because in order to make arabic type work digitally it's breaking up that little bit so it's always great when we can look to other ranks and to inform how we can expand what we're doing So one of the other items that I love in the archive that I didn't actually bring out is this one. Um, it's uh, a process piece. It's like a, what would you call this, Steve? Like it's in progress, sort of? It's a deeper notes from a type director uh, uh, giving advice to one family on how to make their Arabic type. So for folks online, um, notes from a type director uh, uh, about how to make Arabic type from to a foundry. Um, so it, oh, I'm sorry, I did it backwards. Um, so I'll, I'll lift it up in a second. This is just so beautiful because it, it shows this, this process of um, doing the rub downs and then using it to connect the, the forms of Arabic. So for folks here. This is a gorgeous one. So we, we're at least 15 minutes over time. Um, should we call it? 
Yeah, I'm going to call it executive decision. Thank you, everybody online. It was so nice to get your questions, and I hope I get to meet you all someday. Bye. <laughs>